hello, welcome wherever you are around the world to the 3 Z World Cup show. My name is Gabriel D'Angelo, it is wonderful to have your company and speaking of wonderful company, sitting next to me from the Irish Broadcasting Group, the Singing Shamrock, Dianne <laughs> Leonard. How are you Dianne? I'm great Gabe, and you? Good, thank you. And sitting next to Dianne from the German Broadcasting Group, the Social Butterfly, Der Schmetterling, Bernd Merkel. How are you Bernd? I'm very well, thanks Gabriel. That's good to see. And um, it's good to see Australia um, make it to the round of 16. Um, I don't think any of us were expecting that, but uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later in the program. But first, um, this is the second time I'm going to have to uh, ask you this, Bernd. But Bernd, Germany, what happened? Yeah, the, the big question. I think that, <laughs> um, 80 million people in Germany are asking. So, yeah, I mean... Under these circumstances, looking at a sport event, but um, from that perspective, it's it's a disaster, really. I think nobody saw that coming. Um, yes, you could say it was unexpected that uh, Spain won, uh, lost against Japan, but in general, our performance throughout the whole World Cup was not on a level that I would say we deserve to go to the round of last 16. Um, we won against Costa Rica, we did our homework, but again, there were really big mistakes in, in, in defense. And I think there's a lot that needs to be asked, a lot of questions, not only to the players, but also to the coach, to the management. So, um, yeah, um, it's going to be an interesting future. Because, mm. like Diana and I, we did say uh, <laughs> on several occasions, because on paper you see the team, the, the amazing squad, the amazing talent they have, playing in very good leagues, not just in Germany, but also in the English Premier League with Gundogan and so forth, you, you, you see this and you're like, come on, I mean, Germany, they, they can't go out on the, on the first round again. Yeah. We thought maybe all the way or at the very least quarter final. But um, let's be honest, I think that group definitely was a bit more challenging than the one at the last group stage. Still, we should, we should make it, um, no doubt about that. And um, not being as smart as here, but I said it in the first show already. So our defense is not on a world-class level. We have good players, as you said. Rüdiger plays Real Madrid. We have players from Dortmund that play Champions League. But in the end, there is a saying, defense wins championships. Mm -hmm. And our defense lost the first game. And in the end, that was something we were chasing and chasing and didn't come back. So um, from that end, um, but now my question to you is, Ooh. what happened to Uruguay, Gabriel? Uh, what's that? <laughs> oh, we have to cut the commercial. Uh. Oh, okay. So we'll be, now, um, well, look, Uruguay, um, extremely disappointing. Um, that's just to put it mildly. Um, the way that Uruguay came into this World Cup with the, um, the way they were playing in the tail end of the World Cup qualifiers, um, there was all this optimism and this hope. It's like, wow. Some new players have come in, some good young players have come in, players that have, should have been in the national team a long time ago. There was this um, breath of fresh air that, have, uh, that just swept in with um, uh, Diego Alonso as coach. And there was a lot of optimism. I don't, I don't think anyone was expecting Uruguay to win the World Cup, but at the very least, very least, round of 16, because we're well aware Brazil was going to be in the mix for, um, to, for the round of 16 games and, and anything could happen. But um, just this ultra defensive mindset against Portugal just destroyed everything. And we, we said this privately when we were talking about Germany, with the coach, the way that uh, Flick uh, coached Germany, this sort of sense of, okay, we play one style at the World Cup qualifiers, but in the World Cup we'll play completely differently. And sometimes the players, aren't used to it and they're not acclimatised to it, it's like, well, why aren't you playing as offensively and as creatively as you were earlier? It's just terrible coaching. The coach has got everything uh, wrong. So when you talk about the defensive play of a lot of the teams at this World Cup, there seems to be a trend of everyone trying to play smart football at the back and they're getting caught out. And to the point of, say, the Germany-Costa Rica game, I saw a German attack the whole way through the game. They were pushing and pushing and pushing to get those extra goals to make it out of the group stages. They were clean. They didn't mess around in the back line. I know that you've made the statement their defensive line needs to be improved, but I saw a clean, efficient and fair playing team out in that game. And also I was so impressed with Jamal Musiala. 
19, mm. playing at Bayern Munich in the first two games of the 22-23 season. He kicked four goals and three assists. The kid's a superstar. And I think that defensively, when you're that strong in attack, you can allow a little bit of lax in the back because so many teams, Australia, everyone, they're like, oh, let's just kick it around the back. And then the opposition comes in, carves through and off it goes. Well, that was the main criticism we had with Australia against France. Yeah. Too much playing at the back and they just attack. That's right. Yeah. Too much. And like, it seems to be a game strategy and we're sitting here and I know coaches have accountability for directing and managing their teams. But let me tell you, and we've all played this wonderful world game. The minute you step across that line and you get white line fever and you're on the pitch, you're actually in control of yourself. And sometimes it doesn't matter how good the coaching was in the background, you're on, you're responsible for your performance. Yeah. So it is a blend of both. And I just want to see teams attacking and not playing this, let's waste time and play off the back line. It's, I'm, some of the games are frustrating me in this World Cup and some <laughs> of them are super exciting. Yeah. Would you... Uh... Um, agree with there was a little bit of upset up after this uh, Ghana game now you know mm. that they were, so the Uruguay yes the players, the you know players. they were complaining um, but then the coach I think was actually also complaining but not about the ref in that game but about the the penalty in the in the Portugal game so would you agree on that actually I don't agree with the way that they handled themselves uh, the Uruguayan players um, look the the penalty against Portugal it wasn't a penalty but it was already done it's done, it's finished. The fact of the matter is they shouldn't have played the way that they played. They shouldn't have played such an ultra defensive style. That's the coach's fault. Then in the game against Ghana where they had to win and had to throw everything uh, against them, that should never have been a scenario that should have been in play. Like Uruguay should never have been like, okay, we have to win and we have to rely on South Korea and Portugal and all that sort of stuff. That should never have happened and the way that they complained and pushed and shoved the referee. I know it was very similar to a few 3 triple Z AGMs, but, um, <laughs> you know, there, there, there was, like, I, I can get frustration and tension and all that, but um, it, it should never have been, that it should never have got to that situation. So, you know, this was all on the coach. This was all um, bad planning, bad substitutions, having some of your better players on the bench rather than playing, um, it's a recipe for disaster, and that's what happened with Uruguay. There's, there is no excuse. So, where do you see it now developing? The, the coach gonna be sacked. And oh, he's gone for yeah. sure. He'll, he'll be coaching Melbourne Victory this season. <laughs> don't, don't worry about that. But um, he, he's, he, he has all the responsibility. It all ends on him. Um, so he's because there was a plan that he was going to be. The coach of the World Cup and then the Copa America World Cup qualifiers and then possibly if they qualify the next World Cup, um, that's gone. He's, he, let's forget it. It's, it's over. But um, uh, to go on to the other side when it came to Germany with uh, Flick, I, you know, with his coaching. Yeah. yeah um, but I'd say that similar. definitely um, mistakes made um, and he needs to be questioned, unfortunately, maybe his biggest mistake might have cost us this World Cup. Um, uh, getting Gunwan out of that game against Japan where we lost our structure. And then, of course, that still isn't an excuse that the defense made these massive um, mistakes and, and uh, Spain and Japan could score twice. But in the end, yeah, it will be now the task to really build quickly because the European Cup in Germany is coming up in 24. So we won't have any real competitive games until then. Um, there is a yeah, pro and con of that, you know, you can build your team, you don't have that pressure, but on the other hand, yeah, you know, competition um, is always also a, a good, good thing to have. So, um, fingers crossed that they get um, the turnaround and um, we will see uh, in two years then. Yeah, well, I mean, how many times have we seen a, a team have a really poor World Cup and turn things around four years later? But having the, the second one in a row now, so it's it's now really the last four years that Germany lost this status of being a, a tournament team. Yeah. You know, so, um, uh, yeah, the hope is there. But before Christmas, I think a few decisions need to be made. Oh. I'm still on the Germany bandwagon. <laughs> <laughs> they're out. They, they lost. They're out. <laughs> I, I, I Cup, but no, I'm still in the bandwagon. <laughs> I think they're superstars. Oh, and yeah, they yeah. Just yeah. watch them in the future again. They haven't really stepped that far back from their tournament status, as you say. They'll be back.
Yeah, Ge Better. Germany being Germany, I'll, Absolutely. I'll be just fine. You'll, exactly. be, you'll be just fine, I'm sure. But I have a very last question, um, Gabriel, for you and the South American um, football with the World Cup in 2030. So mm -hmm. Uruguay planning yes. to apply together, I think, with Argentina and yeah, Paraguay, Paraguay and, and wow. pretty much everyone, really. Do you, think, <laughs> everyone's just like, do you think they have a chance and is it something desirable for, for Uruguay or...? Well, the, the whole sort of thing is that it's celebrating the 100 years of the World Cup because the first one was in Uruguay in 1930, that sort of celebration, that coming full circle and all that sort of stuff. But we all know um, that you know, commercial interests take a hold. And um, as we saw <laughs> with the Olympic Games when um, you know, Athens was supposed to have the uh, Olympics yeah. in 96 and it went to Atlanta, Georgia, yeah, that was a, a, a great move. Um, but, you know, it, I have my doubts. It, it would be great to see a World Cup in South America again because it's been such a, a long time. Uh, well, no, in Brazil, sorry, yeah. in 2014. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's yeah. COVID, it's affected me. But um, <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it would be good to see um, in countries like, you know, Argentina and Uruguay and Paraguay. But for 100 years, the first one was held in Uruguay. Yes. What are the challenges to standing Uruguay up to hold it and host it on its own? Well, if they have this expanded universe of teams coming in where there's like so many, you know, there are some facilities in Uruguay that, that just can't do it, that, that just don't have the facilities. There are grounds here in suburban Melbourne that are better than some of the first division clubs in Uruguay. That's a sad reality. So, um, you know, Uruguay had no choice but to sort of, you know, say, hey, does anybody else want to join in? But um, I don't know if that's going to happen and, uh, well, we'll see. But that, that's for a future topic in, in the future. But uh, speaking of future, we have to have a quick break. But first, here's some words of wisdom from our friend, Brian Yap. Oh, oh, hey there. I didn't notice you, sorry. Well, you gotta forgive me, but this coffee from Albert Street Cafe, this is so good that I lost track of where I was. Albert Street Cafe is a family-owned business that has the best coffee here in Melbourne. They have the friendliest staff and the best coffee at the best price. Come and see for yourself. Uh oh, where was I? Oh yeah, um, did I tell you that Albert Street Cafe has the best sandwiches too? Albert Street Cafe, 306 Albert Street, Brunswick. Football and the city of Melbourne go hand in hand when it comes to its sporting prowess and its pride in multiculturalism. The Community Soccer Hub is one of many grassroots organisations that makes football affordable and creates ties with its refugee and migrant communities in the western suburbs. To talk about Community Soccer Hub, we have Simon Reynolds with us. Simon, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. So Simon, what exactly is the uh, Community Soccer Hub? Um, you pretty much nailed it in the intro. Okay, that's it. Thanks for coming <laughs> and, uh, no, nah, that's all right. <coughs> Basically, that's it. We, there was a, there's a need everywhere, but especially in the Western suburbs for some of the barriers to participation to be reduced, especially access to ground, which is a massive issue, yeah. and cost and affordability. And, um, about, oh, I lost track of time, 2014 whatever many years ago that was, mm. a lot of different groups came together, a lot of community groups, a lot of organisations came together with the Brimbank City Council because at the time they were kind of lobbying individually and the idea came together to, to collectivise basically, to lobby for access to, to ground and that's, what, that's when the Community Soccer Hub was formed. Okay. So you were talking about uh, the costs, what, what costs are we talking about? Is it for free when, if people want to wanna join? It's all different and it depends on how good we are at fundraising the year before. Yeah. But basically the idea is to keep it free yeah. or as cheap as possible because um, the various communities out in those areas, yeah, I mean, just a lot, of, a lot of them can't afford to join more mainstream football clubs. So, yeah, our job is to give them that like access and then maybe help them push on to, to go somewhere else afterwards. Mm. So, yeah, yeah. So that's an almighty fundraising because... I think by last reckoning you've got is it two senior teams you've got under 12s under 14s and there's a league that gabe wants to be in it's the over 45s but he's waiting for the over 60s for his <laughs> yeah, goalkeeping yeah. skills but they're too quick for me I, um, I just can't do it. and i mean you're playing in places like sunbury um i think you were also in melton epping heidelberg carlton 
and of course your home grounds, my stomping grounds where I grew up, good old Albion down yep. in Selwyn Street Selwyn at the Park. park. Yeah. yeah, the best ground in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. And literally stomping ground for that. So yeah. I know that you've had a push at the start of this current year, season this year to try and get some female players in. Has that changed for you over this season? Have you seen some more women coming forward wanting to join? It's always a push, but basically those those club those teams that you just mentioned they happen organically after people come and participate more casually. Mm -hmm. So we don't force people into to join the team. We call it Albion Thunder, the team that we enter into the leagues. But we just want people to turn up and train and play together. And, and then if some of those people want to take it a little step further and take the competitiveness another level, then we sort out the Albion Thunder team for them based on that. Mm. So we do have lots of casual women's groups at the moment, but... It's not really up to us to be like, hey, it's time you guys join the league. It's it's when they're ready, basically. And yeah, that's that's how it's been for all the teams and that's how it'll be for the women's team too. But obviously we would love, yeah. 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 Not too long ago, I think it might have been last month, uh, Kieran Perkins, uh, who, ex-champion swimmer, who's now the CEO of, of Sport Australia, he actually said that there are more and more people who are participating in, especially in football, in non-traditional uh, organizational structures of football so there are more and more people who aren't involved in clubs and sporting organizations with Football Victoria or mm. with the National Premier League of Victoria more and more people are going to the community soccer hub Melbourne Chinese Soccer Association Melbourne yep. Social Soccer uh, I think we know why that is but do you think for one of a better term do you think this trend will continue especially with cost of living and all that sort of stuff happening I, I don't know I'm kind of I'm kind of torn about it, to be honest, because I love that there's all these different communities kind of just taking matters into their own hands and, and yeah. like making football accessible. There's all sorts of different groups all over Australia and the Melbourne Chinese Soccer Association's mm. the That's perfect huge. example of that because mm. they've got the Afghan team and the like Korean team and it's, it's amazing. But part of me would also like to see that all kind of acknowledged in the 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 wider participation numbers so that then they can take those numbers, lobby government, lobby council to say, look, because there's actually like mm -hmm. thousands and thousands more people that are outside of those kind of official statistics. So while I'm really glad that people are playing, I reckon we could make a better case if there was a bit more help and a bit more support to kind of bring everybody together. I mean, that's the argument with football in Australia that's always been bringing everybody together is always going to be difficult. But I love yeah. that people are playing and I love that people are doing what they can to play, but... I don't know. Yeah, there but needs to be a way to bring it all together. Yeah, he he did but make that point that mm. like especially when it comes to football, there's the ones that the participants that they know of, but then there's the all these others yeah. in organisations such as yourself. It's like they don't know how many people there are. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I don't know how that happens. We've had a few different. We've had discussions with Football Victoria in the past about how to do that, but yeah. Anyway, ongoing. Okay. TBC. <laughs> Of course, looking for, for players on the pitch, but what about, you know, the team behind? So um, are you looking for coaches? Um, do, you, do they need certain qualifications? And, and so, you know, if people want to support you from that end, what, what are you looking for? Or how, how could you be supported? Always, always more coaches. Yeah. We're, like, it's, it's like the volunteers that are, that are there are super passionate and do a lot, but then a lot falls to them to kind of do a lot of work for free mostly. Yeah. Um, and also we have in the past, I mean, COVID kind of put a weird halt to a lot of the things that we were doing, but one of the things we were doing aside from uh, giving people playing opportunities was giving people opportunities to uh, like learn refereeing or coaching badges as well. So yeah, basically keeping people who are into sport, um, who want to be involved in many different ways, giving them many different opportunities to like participate in all sorts of different ways. So, yeah, but always more coaches, always more volunteers are needed because the year coming out of COVID, we actually had to knock back players, which I think is a common theme at the moment. Like, yeah. we just didn't have the, the volunteers to facilitate it, unfortunately. But, yeah, new year coming up this yeah. year. Looking forward to it. <laughs> and, and how can people get into contact with you? Is that via Facebook? I think you're very active on, on that yeah, luckily somebody is. I don't know. If <laughs> but that's probably the best way. And there's an email and there's a very quite outdated website too, but the contacts still stand. Yeah. But yeah, Facebook's probably the way to go, I think. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. What's the Facebook? Uh, is it just Community, just so community Soccer, soccer hub? hub? Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Cool. So 
And when does your drive for um, next season start? Because you started around November last year for the 2022 season. It's supposed to be, it, it's, it's happening now. Um, I'm going to wait and see what happens after six o'clock tomorrow morning. I'll have a bit more energy to focus on getting cracking for next year. Yeah. But yeah, there's summer, There's always summer programs, summer sevens and stuff to keep people engaged. So, so yeah. when do they start yeah. and can people just rock up to participate or do they need to let you know in advance? Bit of both. We've got allocation for casual turn up and play, which is a big part of what the Community Soccer Hub does, which is just providing a place for people to just know that something's happening and turn up and play. And we've also got... Uh, the yeah the kind of more structured environments too, but yeah the, the the juniors and stuff will be starting very soon actually so it'll be on Facebook awesome. have a peek <laughs> and how, what's the um, the relationship or the connection between your organisation and local councils in terms of getting adequate facilities to play and train has it has it always been okay well it started from somebody within the Brimbank City Council who noticed the need actually. Okay. Um, and noticed that lots of different groups were coming to them saying, we need grounds, we need grounds. And um, without the kind of formal organisation to go through the process and have all the, you know, there's all sorts of ABNs and stuff that you need. Um, it was actually someone in um, Greenbank City Council at the time who came up with the idea of bringing everybody together. So I, the relationship is great. It's like they treat us kind of as if we were another club within their council region. Um, so the same facilities, change rooms, the grounds, maintenance, all that kind of stuff is really good. I feel extremely grateful because I don't know if you've seen Selwyn Park, but it's, it's beautiful. <laughs> it's magic. So yeah. we feel very grateful as well. And that helps as well, like, build the sense of belonging to the people who come there, that they're not just ditching them out in the outer suburb somewhere. Yeah. And it actually feels like a club and it actually feels like they've got you know, the facilities to be taken seriously. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm very grateful. I think we have a good relationship. That's good. Yeah. And I think the community is, is very grateful as well because, I mean, it's not like, you know, a full-time uh, job for you, if, if I understand correctly, right? So it's... Yeah. And, and that's really very inspiring and, and, and we need more people like you definitely to um, keep the, the soccer community growing in, in Australia. And hopefully we get a little boost now or maybe a big boost through the soccer rules at this World Cup. Yeah, yeah. I'm not worried about the boost to players. I want yeah. to see a boost to the some funding. <laughs> <laughs> I want to yeah. see a bit yeah, of not enough. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. I want to see Football Australia make the most of this opportunity to really lobby hard because I feel like there's been many wasted years. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Okay. But, but before we let you go, in a few hours' time, the soccer rules do play Argentina. What do you think? <laughs> I'm still in shock from Tunisia a week ago. <laughs> and anything's possible. Yeah. Like, I, I, I'm in shock, to be honest. I watched all of the qualifiers. I didn't think we would make it at all, let alone getting this far. Yeah. And I'm really enjoying... I mean, okay, I'm not necessarily enjoying the conceding, you know, 80% possession because that just makes me nervous. <laughs> yeah. But I'm loving the energy and the fight and... I'm just loving it all. So I don't know, anything's possible, honestly. Like, yeah. who knows? I'm not going to predict anything, though. I'm happy we're this far. Fair enough. Yeah. Neither are we, because all our predictions have been really bad. <laughs> so, yeah, so, yeah it's, it's one of those well casts. But, uh, yeah, thank you very much, Simon, for coming. And, and we wish you and everybody at Community Soccer Hub all the very best. Thank you so much. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. So we have to take a quick break. On the other side of the break, we have Mexican football Luis Gonzalez. But first, our friend Brian Yap has some things to say. Go nuts, yappers. Hey, tradies and DIYers, listen to this. Bowens have everything you need to fix up your bathroom, your bedroom, your kitchen, your whole house if you want to. Bowens are the builder's choice for a reason. If you want to get the job done properly, done professionally, and done on time and on a budget, you know where to go. That's right, follow that big yellow sign there and head to Bowens. Bowens have been servicing the community for 128 years so they know what they're doing. Come visit the friendly staff and ask how Bowens can help you today. Bowens, the builder's choice.